Russian leaders' meetings with his bird leaders. UN Secretary, you know, Secretary General was in Moscow today, and Lavrov, some of the statements that came out of Russia today, in fact, came during those meetings. And uh, President uh, Putin made a statement during, during his phone call with Erdogan talking about, you know, already having Mariupol in his hands. My question is, do you think the world leaders' communications with Russian leaders should be, you know, preconditioned with uh, getting out of Ukraine first before we communicate with them? We believe this war uh, has to be brought through to a close through dialogue and diplomacy. Uh, and we've consistently said that we support diplomatic efforts that are done in full coordination. In the first instance with Ukraine, uh, that's most important because these are not choices uh, that will be the purview of any other country, any other international organization. Uh, the Ukrainian government, an expression of the will of the Ukrainian people, ultimately is going to have to be the entity uh, that makes decisions uh, that affect its country going forward. Uh, so whether it's the efforts of the Turkish government, of the German government, of the Israeli government, of the French government, uh, of other governments who have uh, used their good offices or offered their auspices uh, for dialogue between the parties or attempted to shuttle uh, between Russia and Ukraine, uh, we support those efforts as long as they're done in full coordination uh, with our Ukrainian partners. Yes. Thank you, Dad. A um, couple of questions about the second year section. This is something that the Secretary was asked at today's um, um, hearing at the Senate. Um, as the leaked phone calls suggested yesterday, sanctioned a Russian oligarch, who is one of the major architects of uh, this war, Mr. Evtushenko, and Georgia's richest man, oligarch Ivanishvili, who controls the Georgian politics from the shadow, they are figuring out the ways to bypass the sanctions and secure supply of vital grain products to Russia. Evtushenko himself confirmed the authenticity of this conversation in the interview with the Georgian media. Based on these leaked phone calls, David Arapamia, who is a leading Ukrainian politician who chairs the negotiations with Russia, had, he appealed to the Western leaders to consider imposing personal sanctions on Ivanishvili and his assets in the West. Does the U.S. track or assess um, this phone call, this leaked phone conversation? Do you have any assessment of that? And uh, what would be your response to that, you know, the, when it comes to, like, imposing secondary sanctions to those countries or institutions who are helping Russia or Belarus, you know, bypass these harsh um, measures? So I'm not in a position to speak to any purportedly leaked phone call or to mm -hmm. confirm the authenticity or not uh, of what you're referring to, but uh, a couple points. Uh, not only have we leveled uh, sanctions and other tools against those who are responsible for the Kremlin's decision uh, to go into Ukraine, those in Russia, those uh, in Ukraine, uh, but last week we announced uh, a large tranche, tranche of sanctions uh, against those responsible for facilitating sanctions evasion. And so sanctions evasion is something that we are taking a very close look at uh, around the world, whether that's in Russia, whether that's in Belarus, uh, whether that is uh, anywhere else around the world. And I think our actions last week demonstrated that uh, we will go after uh, those networks, those entities, those individuals uh, who are uh, willfully, deliberately, uh, systematically uh, evading uh, or helping others to evade these sanctions. Of course, I'm not in a position to preview uh, sanctions on any individual or any specific entities, um, but it's something we're taking a very close look at. Yes, Jane. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nick. Uh, I have two questions on uh, South and North Korea. Can I ask about Ukraine? North Korea? Uh, sure. Before we go on to uh, another region, uh, we'll take a couple of final Ukraine questions. We need to, Connor? Sure. Uh, Mr. Secretary Blinken announced, um, <clears throat> excuse me, on Monday that the uh, State Department would return some diplomats to the community this week. Can you confirm whether or not that has started today and, and if they successfully made the journey back to Poland today? I can confirm that. Uh, the Deputy Chief of Mission and members of the embassy team uh, traveled to Lviv, Ukraine today, uh, where they were able to continue our close collaboration uh, with key Ukrainian partners. Uh, today they met with interlocutors from the Ukrainian Ministry uh, of Foreign Affairs. Uh, as Secretary Blinken announced yesterday, our diplomats are uh, returning uh, and have returned to Ukraine this week on a temporary basis. Today's travel was a first step ahead of more regular travel in the immediate future. And as we've said, we're accelerating preparations uh, to resume Embassy Kyiv operations uh, just as soon 
as possible. Uh, we are constantly assessing and evaluating and reassessing the security situation with a view towards resuming those embassy operations uh, as soon as possible, again, to facilitate uh, our support to the government and people of Ukraine as they bravely uh, defend uh, their country. On, on yep. um, Bridget Brink being uh, finally nominated, what took so long? It's been you know over a year into this administration. You said you prioritized this relationship. Why did it take so long to get a, a nomination? Well, the fact is that we haven't had, unfortunately, an ambassador in Ukraine in several years now. And of course, need not go into uh, why we didn't have an ambassador there in the first place. Uh, but uh, there are processes um, both within our government uh, and coordination uh, with the host country government, in this case, our Ukrainian partners, uh, that are a prerequisite uh, before we're in a position to uh, announce a nominee publicly. Uh, in this case, we've been uh, gratified to hear uh, of the reception to her nomination. Of course, we've heard uh, a very positive response from our Ukrainian partners. Uh, and today, uh, for those of you who are watching Secretary Blinken on the Hill, uh, you heard again a very positive and welcome reception uh, to the news from members of Congress, uh, who we hope will be in a position to take up her nomination uh, very shortly. Now, just to check on the Lviv thing, that they, no one went in yesterday? Today was the first day. Uh, you yeah, mentioned that's not what I'm at. The, for those people, so did anyone go in yesterday? On Monday? T today was the first day that we had embassy off. Anyone? Uh, well, okay. That's right. And you returned at night. Correct. Correct. Yes. You uh, traveling on embassy. Is it a I, let me let me take a couple. Any uh, one more question on Ukraine? Uh, Simon, let's move it around. Yeah. Um, the secretary uh, has spoken, including uh, on the Hill today, about the the war entering a, a different phase. Um, and obviously, this is something that was discussed in the meeting with Zelensky with, with the other Ukrainian officials. Um, in terms of what new weapons are required by the Ukrainians for this new phase. Uh, you know, you've spoken about howitzers, long-range artillery. Um, you know, are there any other uh, types of weaponry that they're particularly asking for and that you're, you're considering giving any more sophisticated systems than, than that? Well, I, I think it um, uh, would start by saying that we've already provided uh, sophisticated systems uh, directly or facilitated the provision of sophisticated uh, systems directly in response uh, to what our Ukrainian partners uh, have been asking for. And it is a regular staple of our engagement with our Ukrainian partners that they update us uh, on their particular needs. And those needs are different now than they were in the earliest days and hours uh, of the invasion, because as you alluded to, uh, Russia's aggression is shifting uh, from uh, its initial ambitions to take the capital city, uh, its initial ambitions to engage in successful urban warfare, uh, to now uh, the campaign for the South and the East. And so as uh, Russia's war aims have shifted after they've been uh, defeated uh, in their initial aspirations, uh, the nature of our assistance uh, has changed as well in terms of the capabilities and the systems that uh, we are uh, providing them. Uh, when Secretary Austin and Secretary Blinken met with President Zelensky and his team in Kyiv on Sunday, there was a discussion uh, of, the, uh, of the battlefield and precisely what uh, implications that battlefield uh, holds for Ukrainian needs. You heard from Secretary Blinken in the aftermath of that, that we had, um, we're going to be in a position to provide hundreds of millions of dollars more uh, in FMF, foreign military financing. This is uh, separate and distinct uh, from the presidential drawdowns that you've heard us um, put forward in previous weeks, but it is equally uh, useful. And in many ways, it gives our Ukrainian partners flexibility in terms of uh, what it is that they are procuring from the United States uh, for their defensive needs against this uh, Russian aggression. Uh, Secretary Blinken also announced uh, more than uh, $150 million or so uh, in terms of ammunition, the Department of Defense has talked about uh, the artillery, the uh, systems that the Ukrainians have requested uh, for uh, the battle for uh, the Donbass, and I'll defer to the DOD to speak to that. question about the German tanks, sure. which is, you know, finally the, the Germans today uh, agreed to send their tanks. Well, now, according to Reuters, Switzerland is refusing to do the re-export of the ammo needed for those tanks. Is there... Anything the U.S. can do with Switzerland to try to smooth this out, given how long Ukraine has been waiting for the German? Well, Germany has been an important partner, an important member of the coalition that we have put together 
uh, not only in recent weeks, but over the course of, of recent months. And we welcome Germany's announcements uh, over the course of months that it will increase defense spending, bolster defense capability and readiness. Uh, its announcement that it had halted uh, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline and uh, its transfer of lethal assistance and now heavy weaponry to Ukraine. Uh, these bold moves, we think, will strengthen Germany's role as a leader in global security in line with its diplomatic, economic development and humanitarian influence in Europe uh, and around the world. It's not for us to speak to specific systems or assets or capabilities that any other country is uh, providing. So I'll leave it to our German allies to speak to uh, what it is precisely uh, that they're providing. Uh, and I would have to refer you to the Swiss government for any uh, um, uh, discussions between those sure. two governments. Yes. Um, uh, Georgia participated in, in every peace mission and is a valuable NATO partner. Having this in mind, can Georgia get any tentative dates uh, regarding its aspirations to become a NATO EU member? We all have heard that it's a consensus-based decision, but don't you think the Georgian people and government uh, deserve to know how much longer uh, they need to wait instead of being told that... Uh, it will happen someday. And second question, please. You say you understand Georgia's uh, position very well, but it's fact that there are both uh, some opposition members inside of my country and also inside of, our, of my country who are trying to nudge Georgia toward a decidedly radical pos uh, position on this. And this is happening in parallel to the ongoing Russian invasion in Ukraine. In our partner uh, country, there uh, was even talk of opening up a second front in Russia. Uh, um, on Russia. And this is being advised to a country that uh, together with Moldova faces the greatest risk of re re renewed uh, Russian aggression. As you know, 20% of my country uh, is occupied, of, uh, occupied by Russia. What objectives do you think this campaign for more radical stance and increased pressure on the Georgian government serve? This has been, as I uh, said, uh, uh, inside of my country and uh, outside of my uh, country, I mean uh, opposition members. And uh, this campaign is permitted with so much disinformation, the uh, so-called uh, secret recordings that are paraded as uh, scandalous or exclusive uh, while neither in the case. Thank you. So on your first question, uh, we have said for some 15 years now uh, that we support Georgia's NATO aspirations. Uh, we believe that uh, NATO's open door policy uh, it should be an open door uh, for those countries that aspire uh, to join the alliance. We've also said uh, that no outside entity uh, can or should have a veto on uh, any eligible country's aspirations uh, to join the NATO membership. Now, as you alluded to in your question, uh, the uh, membership process uh, it is a uh, process uh, that is overseen by uh, the alliance. These will be alliance decisions. There are a set of requirements that any aspirant country uh, will need to fulfill um, before being uh, eligible uh, to be considered for uh, full membership. But Georgia already is an important NATO partner. Uh, we have had uh, close consultations with Georgia uh, on the margins of NATO meetings. Uh, and to your second question, uh, and this bridges the two, uh, we have consistently uh, stood by Georgia and with the people of Georgia uh, and their desire to be a free and, and sovereign people in a free and sovereign country. And over the years, from the earliest days of uh, Georgia's post-Soviet independence, independence uh, we have now developed a uh, strategic partnership uh, between our countries. We work together towards our shared vision of a Georgia that is fully integrated into the Euro-Atlantic family of nations and part of a Europe that is whole, uh, free, and uh, we would hope at peace. Uh, and this is a vision that uh, takes hard work, it takes patience, uh, it takes significant resources to realize. Uh, that's why we have uh, sought to do our part. We have allocated almost $6 billion in assistance uh, funds to Georgia. We've trained over 20,000 Georgian soldiers. Uh, we've sent over 6,000 people to the United States for cultural and educational exchange programs. We've helped promote economic growth, the rule of law, democratic government governance, many other initiatives that are important to the Georgian people and their aspirations, but important interests of ours uh, as well. And so we'll continue to partner with Georgia uh, on their uh, aspirations, on their ambitions, uh, and to protect uh, what they've been able to achieve. Jenny, I'll go back to you. Thank you very much uh, on the North Korea. I have a few questions also in North Korea. 
North Korean leader Kim Jong Un mentioned the preemptive use of their nuclear weapons at a military parade in Pyongyang yesterday. Regarding Kim Jong Un's emphasis on the use of nuclear force rather than dialogue for abandoning the nuclear program, how can you assessing the prospect for future dialogue with North Korea? And I follow up next question. Well, to start, uh, your reference to uh, Kim Jong Un's speech yesterday at the military parade. Uh, we're aware of uh, what he said. Uh, it reiterates our assessment that the DPRK constitutes a threat to international peace and security uh, and to the global nonproliferation regime. Uh, we have a vital interest together with our allies and partners around the world, but especially those in the Indo Pacific, uh, to uh, deter uh, the DPRK, to defend against its provocations or uh, its use of force to limit the reach of its most dangerous weapons programs, and above all, to keep safe uh, American people in the region, our deployed forces, and our uh, allies, uh, Japan and the ROK uh, being two of them. Our, our goal remains the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Uh, as you've heard me say before, and as recently as last week, we harbor no hostile intent uh, toward the DPRK. We do remain open to engaging in diplomacy and dialogue with the DPRK uh, with an aim of achieving progress uh, towards that overall objective. Uh, but we also have uh, an obligation to address the recent provocations that we've seen from the DPRK, including uh, its two recent uh, ICBM launches. We have an obligation to enforce uh, the UN Security Council resolutions that are in place. Those are obligations that we'll continue uh, to work on very closely uh, with our allies in the region, with our partners in the region, uh, and with our allies and partners at the UN. And it goes without saying, of course, that our commitment uh, to our treaty allies, Japan and the ROK, uh, is ironclad and remains that way. Second question. Uh, according to a recent exchange of a personal letter between South Korean President Moon and uh, North Korean leader Kim Jong Un. In this letter, North Korea contains three conditions for dialogue with South Korea. What is your assessment of the sincerity of uh, Kim Jong Un's personal letter? It's not for me to assess the sincerity uh, of anything that has come from the DPRK. What we've said before uh, is that we support uh, inter Korean dialogue, we support uh, anything that uh, de-escalates tensions and that moves us closer uh, towards our shared objective with the ROK, uh, and that's the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Joseph. Thanks. Um, Secretary Blinken was asked multiple times today about the uh, Vienna talks and uh, nuclear deal. He was, I mean, he used very intricate language multiple times when it came to the FTO designation um, and specifying the Quds Force. Um, can you give us any updates on where those are? Are there, you know, is there anything scheduled, any meeting scheduled back in Vienna? And is that what's holding up the deal the, uh, right now? Is it the FTO designation on the IRGC or the IRGC could source? We don't have any travel uh, to Vienna to preview. Uh, we are in close contact with the EU coordinator uh, who continues to convey messages uh, back and forth. Uh, we continue, as you heard me uh, say just the other day, uh, we remain um, hopeful that an agreement can be reached, uh, but it can be reached only if Iran is prepared to uh, conclude a deal uh, without, for example, raising issues that are extraneous to uh, the JCPOA. If that's the case, uh, we believe that we can uh, achieve a mutual return to compliance of the JCPOA in fairly short order. And that <coughs> remains our goal for a couple of reasons. You heard the secretary speak to this uh, today, it remains our goal principally uh, because President Biden has a commitment to see to it that Iran is never in a position to acquire a nuclear weapon. And the fact is uh, that while the JCPOA was in full effect from implementation day uh, in early 2016 until May of 2018, uh, Iran was verifiably and permanently prevented from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Uh, and again, when the JCPOA was in full effect, uh, the breakout time, that is to say, uh, the time that Iran would require to produce enough fissile material for a nuclear weapon if it chose 
uh, to go in that direction uh, was about 12 months when the deal was consummated and, and fully in effect. Uh, now, and the Secretary said this today, uh, that breakout time is measured not in months, but unfortunately in weeks. Uh, and that is something that is unacceptable to us as a long-term proposition. Uh, that is why we continue to see if we can reach a conclusion, uh, a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA. But as we've said, we're preparing equally for uh, either world, a world in which we have a JCPOA and a world in which uh, we are uh, forced to uh, seek other means to um, be faithful to the president's commitment. Now, the challenge is, uh, we've seen both of these worlds. Uh, we've seen what a world with a fully functioning uh, JCPOA looks like. And again, that's a world in which Iran is verifiably and permanently constrained from obtaining a nuclear weapon with a breakout time uh, that is extended. Uh, and we've seen a world without a JCPOA. Uh, so this is not a thought experiment. Uh, unfortunately, there's been a real world experiment uh, when it comes to uh, the utility of the JCPOA. And in the world uh, in which the JCPOA, JCPOA has been suspended. Uh, not only have we seen Iran's nuclear program gallop forward with the installation of centrifuges, the uh, accumulation of nuclear material, uh, various developments that would contravene uh, the obligations under uh, the JCPOA, uh, but we've seen Iran that has acted with even greater impunity. Uh, we've seen an Iran that has enabled its proxies, that has supported um, uh, malevolent uh, groups and actors uh, in the region. We've seen an Iran that has continued uh, with its ballistic missile program. We've seen an Iran uh, that has continued to be a deeply destabilizing force uh, to the region. Uh, we believe that if we are able to put Iran's nuclear program back into a box, if we are able to contain what would constitute uh, the greatest challenge we could face from Iran, the greatest challenge we could face in the region, uh, that we will be more effective and better positioned uh, to confront these other challenges uh, that we face with Iran. So there's some distance yet to close. It's unclear if we're going to be able to get there, um, but it remains our assessment that mutually returning to the JCPOA would profoundly be in our interest and will pursue that mutual return uh, as long as it remains in our interest. You, you mentioned yourself um, months ago that this wouldn't be open-ended. And uh, I mean, the talks have been going on for a little over a year. Granted, I mean, that it's, not, it's not an easy agreement to reach, but um, I mean, surely, and you guys have also been saying the, the breakout time is a matter of weeks for now months. Um, so I mean, how, how much longer are you guys willing to wait? Because it seems like, you know, Iran's has its demands and they're not backing down. Well, we're, we're going to test the proposition of a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA for as long as doing so remains in our interests. Uh, and the fact is that right now, Iran's breakout time, uh, it is far shorter than we would like. Uh, were we to re-enter the JCPOA and, and uh, more precisely, were Iran to once again be subject to the most stringent verification and monitoring regime uh, ever negotiating, negotiated, that breakout time would be extended. Uh, so as long as the non-proliferation benefits that a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA uh, brings uh, is better than what we have now, that will likely be an outcome that's in our interest. But again, uh, we may not be able to get there uh, because a negotiation uh, in this case, not only does it take two parties, but uh, there are multiple parties in this, uh, and there are complex questions, some of which remain unresolved. And on this, and I'll leave aside the argument that we could get into over whether everyone agrees that the JCPOA permanently and verifiably ended near nuclear potential, Iran's nuclear potential, leaving, leaving, leaving that aside. The Secretary seemed to suggest in his answers today that the State Department and the DNI had made a determination that the threat against former Secretary Pompeo and Special Envoy Hook from Iran continued, and that you are continuing to pay uh, whatever amount it is uh, per month for protection for them. Uh, did, is that correct? Is that a correct reading of what he said? There is only so much I can say on this, but we have an obligation uh, that we take very seriously. Uh, to provide protection to former officials uh, of this building who may be subject to a threat. Now, I think you could understand why 
Uh, if someone were in fact subject to a foreign threat, we probably wouldn't want to speak to that publicly so as not to uh, spotlight uh, something like that, to spotlight uh, measures we might be taking uh, to mitigate any such threat. Uh, but you heard this from the National Security Advisor on January 9th, I think it was, of this year. Uh, he issued a very clear statement. Yes, but after, after that, and I remember that, and I appreciate the fact that he said that, but after that, you guys notified the Hill that you were spending $2 million a month, roughly, to, for protection for these two former officials. And also that a decision had to be made within the next, within 10 days of that notification, uh, whether or not you were going to ask for more money to continue that protection. And it sounded to me, from, from what the secretary said, that you had made that decision. We notify the Hill of many things that we're not in a position to speak about publicly. Uh, let me move around. Just can Yes, I, please. Can I just follow up on Iran? Okay. Quick follow up on Iran. Okay. Uh, the Israeli, the Times of Israel reported that the Israeli officials are saying that uh, the Americans have basically acknowledged the failure of the Vienna talks, and you're about to make that public in a very short order. Can you comment on that? My comment would be precise to the answer that I offered uh, to Joseph just a moment ago, so, uh, that we are going to pursue a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA as long as it remains in our national interest to do so. So the Israelis in this case are wrong, exaggerating? That uh, it sounds like you're citing a press report that's citing anonymous Israelis. So uh, oftentimes that is a recipe for information that may not be entirely accurate. I have a wrong yes. question. To okay. Sorry. Um, I just want to build off what Joseph was asking you. Um, can you just explain to us how the breakout time has remained weeks for months now? It seems to indicate that Iran has slowed down accelerating its program, uh, has, you know, uh, done it more slowly than you expected it to. Is that the case? Can you just explain how we're in the same place we were in January, February? Well, the breakout time is an assessment. It's an assessment based on uh, our technical uh, know-how. It's an assessment assessment. Uh, that is based on um, uh, non-public sources of information as well. So there's only so much uh, we can say on this. Uh, but I don't think it's fair uh, to say that uh, the Iranians are uh, or feel uh, constrained uh, right now in terms of their nuclear program. Uh, and that's precisely why we are still testing the proposition of a potential mutual return to compliance, so that they are constrained. Uh, by the JCPOA, the constraints that are conveyed by the JCPOA in terms of centrifuges, in terms of amassing uh, nuclear material, in terms of amassing heavy water, uh, in terms of uh, what all of that means for a potential uh, breakout time. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, I have a quick question about China. Uh, the Secretary Blinken to, uh, mentioned today, uh, he will speak publicly about comprehensive strategy to deal with China. So the United States has published uh, interim national security strategy and in Pacific strategy already, uh, which are focusing on China uh, in some ways. So could you tell us, understand, uh, could you help us understand what the difference between the uh, incoming strategy and the on ongoing strategies? So the secretary did mention that he expected to have an opportunity in the coming days, coming weeks, uh, to speak in a, in a bit more depth uh, to our approach to the PRC. I think what you're referring to when you mention our Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, this was a strategy that Secretary Blinken laid out uh, on a fairly fairly memorable trip uh, for those of you who were with us uh, in Jakarta uh, late last year, in December of, of last year. And our Indo-Pacific strategy, as the name suggests, uh, is focused on the broader region, uh, is focused on uh, principally our partnership with uh, the region and our uh, shared vi vision uh, with and for the region. It's a vision of uh, a region that is uh, centered on key elements. Uh, first, advancing a, a free and open Indo-Pacific in which problems are dealt with openly. Uh, rules will be reached transparently and, and applied fairly. Goods and ideas, people will flow freely. Uh, second, it's about forging stronger connections uh, within and beyond the region uh, on a bilateral basis or uh, on a multilateral basis, if you talk about uh, the Quad, uh, or stitching together uh, our partnerships and alliances, uh, if you were to talk about, for, for example, an AUKUS. Um, third, it's a vision that promotes broad base prosperity uh, for the region, again, uh, with us uh, as a partner, knowing that uh, the region is home to some 40% 
of global GDP. It's a region of opportunity, uh, not only for uh, the people of the region, but also uh, for the United States. It's a vision that seeks to build a more resilient Indo-Pacific, uh, resilience against COVID, resilience against climate change, uh, resilience against uh, shared threats. And, and finally, uh, it's a region in which we seek to bolster security. And there are any number uh, of threats. Uh, and when it comes to our assessment, uh, our system of alliances and partnerships uh, is the most important tool we have uh, when it comes to confronting those threats. So it's a vision principally for a broader region. We've talked about uh, our approach to the PRC. Uh, we've talked about the multifaceted relationship uh, we have with the PRC, but I know that the Secretary looks forward in, in the coming days uh, to speaking a bit more about that. Can I, uh, can I ask a yes. question yep. on Boston Age Radiation? Uh, uh, Ned, it's been six months since uh, six organizations were designated as terrorist organizations. I know I've asked you this question many times before, so please indulge me. You know, so and I know that you requested clarification from the Israelis, and you received that clarification. Are you satisfied that these organizations, these six organizations, are in fact engaged in terrorist activities? You know, because their funding has been cut off. The European Union is looking at maybe there's been experts today, UN experts that said they should be funded. There's been no evidence that they have engaged in terrorist activities. What is your uh, assessment after the Israelis responded to you? As I've said for some time now, Saeed, our Israeli partners have provided us with information regarding the basis for uh, their determination. That's information that we're reviewing. It's a process that can be lengthy because it's a process that takes place not only here, not only here in this building, but uh, also uh, across other departments and agencies uh, across town. I can say more broadly uh, that we've made it very clear to our Israeli government and Palestinian, Palestinian Authority uh, interlocutors uh, that independent civil society organizations in the West Bank and in Israel uh, must be able to continue their important work uh, we value the monitoring of human rights violations and abuses that independent NGOs undertake in Gaza, undertake in the West Bank, undertake uh, in Israel and, and elsewhere. And we strongly believe that respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms and a strong civil society are critically important to responsive and to responsive uh, democratic governance. Uh, it's also important to note that uh, we have already designated, we long ago designated the PFLP as, a, as an FTO. Uh, they have been designated as an FTO since 1997. Uh, and we've not designated, as you know, any of the six NGOs uh, that the Israeli uh, government did. Uh, it's also important to note we haven't funded these groups. But the PFLP is one thing, and this organization is another thing altogether. And I understand that you have designated the PFLP a long time ago as a terrorist organization. And there's maybe a good reason for that. But on these six organizations, they have conducted themselves only in, in terms of human rights abuses, reporting on that, you know, doing civil uh, society organizations and so on. That's something we're looking at. Uh, Ned, on Ned, Israel, you presume that you've seen these uh, very lengthy um, regulations that were dated February, but apparently take effect uh, in May uh, for, entry, for entry by foreigners into the West Bank? I'm not immediately familiar with them, but if we have a reaction, we'll let you know. Uh, yeah, because it would require foreigners of any <clears throat> any nationality to get prior approval from Israeli military officials at the embassy to where they're applying for uh, a visa before they can even present themselves for entry into the West Bank. So, yes, I'd be very interested in any uh, reaction you have, and also if this will have any impact on the visa waiver um, negotiations uh, because, as you know, one of the main sticking points in that has been the treatment of Palestinian Americans. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Simon. I just wanted to try and clarify something. You, you, the uh, Indo-Pacific strategy that you were mentioning, I think uh, the, the exchange that, that took place in, 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 on the Hill earlier, the Secretary was being asked about a formal national security strategy on China. Uh, and your response just now, um, you seem to suggest he will address this issue in coming weeks, but there isn't a separate strategy for China that's, that's forthcoming. Can you just clarify? Uh, he's going to address something in, in coming weeks, but it's not going to be a... a well, the, 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 the question was how remarks on the PRC might be different from the Indo-Pacific strategy uh, that, uh, that the Secretary uh, 
uh, explained in December of last year. And so my uh, answer was the fact that uh, that was a regional uh, strategy. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, uh, about any one country. It was about our uh, partnership with the region and our bilateral relationships uh, with the countries of the region and the uh, uh, relationships we have uh, bilaterally and multilaterally uh, with blocks in the region as well. So the Secretary will detail a specific strategy for China? The, the Secretary looks forward to speaking more about our approach to the PRC in the coming days. Uh, yeah, question, yeah, final yeah. question? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Actually, two questions on Ukraine. First, to uh, clarify on what you just said in your response to Carlos' question on embassy. Um, you mentioned traveling. Are the diplomats going back and forth? Is it like day long? Do you have any timeline on when the embassy in Kiev will be restaffed? And my second question after they are they are making uh, for the time being day trips uh, into Lviv. That first day trip started today. As I said before, we are accelerating planning to uh, reestablish a diplomatic presence in our at our embassy in Kiev. It is something we want to do uh, as soon as it is uh, responsible for us to do so. Awesome. And second question on uh, the last weekend's meeting. There are reports that uh, Zelensky handed over. Uh, uh, plan to strengthen sanctions. Uh, it's about wrapping up sanctions against Russia um, and enablers. Uh, any, uh, are you in a position to uh, confirm those reports? Well, I think there are reports because in the Ukrainian government readout, it said that President Zelensky handed over uh, a document uh, regarding uh, the uh, Yermak McFall International Expert Group on strengthening sanctions. Uh, so sanctions enforcement, the next step uh, in our sanctions uh, against Russia and uh, those who are enabling uh, the Kremlin's war against Ukraine. That certainly was uh, a topic of uh, discussion and uh, we'll continue to coordinate closely with our Ukrainian partners on that. Thank you.